Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, everyone, being part of the program. Hour number two on a Monday morning. It still remains our seventh favorite day of the week, but it is improved because if it weren't for Monday, we wouldn't have our show po hour, and thank goodness we do. And thank goodness the boys are in studio once again with Bobby, Steve, and Mark. And aloha, gentlemen. How's everyone doing so far? Good. Doing good. Morning, Rick. Morning. Good, good, good morning. I'm going to go across just like we do every week for our first-time listeners. Bobby, start off with a brief introduction and why we're here today. Well, good morning, Rick. Another week, another hour, Mm -hmm. another discussion. Um, Bobby Cavaco, president of Shopo. Um, I have 22 years in the police department. I'm a lieutenant assigned to the traffic division. Oversee the vehicle homicide section and our night enforcement unit. And we're on with you to further discuss about the issues that affect our membership. Our officers that serve statewide Mm -hmm. from Kauai, Honolulu, from Maui, Maui County, and the Big Island. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks for the setup, Bobby. Thank you so much. Brother Steve. Hey, good morning, Rick. Happy and grateful to be here with you, boys, and your listening audience. My name is Steve Keogh. I'm the vice president of Shopo. I have 15 years of service with Honolulu PD. I'm a patrol sergeant right here in urban Honolulu, which makes up Chinatown, Kakako, the Mountain, and Ala Moana. I've been involved with Shopo in various capacities since 2013. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, brother. Brother Mark. Morning, Rick. Morning, Bobby. Morning, Steve. Good to be here. Uh, retired major, Honolulu Police Department, 31 and a half years of service. Uh, my last command was Waikiki. And there we have it. Thank you, Brother Mark. And we're just going to jump right on in. It has been an exhaustive uh, effort to educate, inform, give perspective on various bills in the big square building. We do it every year. This year, however, a four-letter word is a four-numbered uh, title, 1567. This is the cash bail reform bill. It has passed. It is set for the governor to act and we can go through some of the machinations of that. But the important thing is where we are today with the passage of this, I'll turn it over to the gentleman. Uh, What does this truly mean in its form? And if it's allowed to go into law, what will be the impact? And share some of the uh, supporters' viewpoint of this bill and how it differs with yours. And I'm looking forward the facts, and what really happens in regard to crime. Who would like to start for us today? I'll start. You know, this bill, um, 1567, ultimately, in the end, it's going to make our community more unsafe, really. Crime is going to increase. It's going to tie the officer's hands when they, uh, or when we make arrests. Um, When we talk about this bill, we're all nonviolent, crimes from the lowest level all the way up to a class c felony where it's no cash bail and they just get released our officers are are just appalled that our legislators uh are is are taking this stand these these uh criminals that are committing these crimes are going to be out the door before our officers even finish typing their report you know yeah and um just to see, you know, when, when we talk about the victims of crimes, when somebody is a victim of a crime, whether it's a crime against person or it's a, a property, uh, you know, property damage or theft, they're not worried whether the offender has $500 in their pocket to make bail. They're worried about their safety, their safety of their community. That's what they're worried about. They're not worried about whether or not the offender can make bail and get out of jail, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing, you know, I'll just jump in real quick, is that it has been categorized by supporters of this bill to be a few different things. Number one, it's punishment of the poor. You're selecting those who may not have the means and locking them up simply because they can't post bail. Second of all, there is an argument that says that this is in opposition to to our Constitution and the Founding Fathers who created the concept of innocent before guilty. You're not proven guilty at the point of an apprehension, 
So th- you should not be incarcerated for any amount of time. And then the argument, last part, argument, because of these arrests, you're putting undue burden on our prison space, which is already challenged. Nonviolent offenders should not be incarcerated. Uh, they should, in fact, be left, here we go, to their own recognizance. Those are three, just three off the top of my head that resonate with supporters of this bill. Uh, who'd like to jump in? Brother Mark, Brother Steve? Oh, I don't know where to start with this. This is totally ridiculous. But let, let, let me start with uh, bail. Bail is mm-hmm. made to ensure you show up to court. It's not against the poor. It's not against. It's, it's just one of their uh, talking points to get their little bills through, right? To get their little uh, agendas through. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you a rundown when I was a lieutenant at the receiving desk. Okay. In Waikiki? No, no, no. Oh, just for the whole department. For the whole department. So okay. I, was a, I was a lieutenant at the Central Receiving Division where all arrests come through. Okay. The desk lieutenant is responsible for setting bail for petty mister, misdemeanors and misdemeanors. Okay. Judges are responsible for setting bail for felonies. So when a detective has a case and there's a felony, the case gets all wrapped up and they will call a judge for bail. They'll give the judge the circumstances, the judge will set a bail. Nine times out of ten, the judge will not give us the bail that we want. They will always say, oh, no, too much, too much, too much, and they, they knock it down, knock it down. But they're responsible for the felony bail. So. So can I stop for a moment? Yeah, sure. So now the uh, suspect, the apprehended individual, they have judicial process. They have a judge for, you know, jurisprudence is in action. Sure it is. So, okay, just want it to make absolutely sure. absolutely is. Yeah. So... I'm going to give you an example. Someone, uh, an, an officer arrests somebody for shoplifting. Mm-hmm. They come down to the receiving desk, give me circumstances of the case. If I deem there's pros- probable cause for the case, I will set bail. There's a bail schedule given to us set by the judiciary. We just don't make these things up out of the air. And, and there's a parameter we go by, and there's a list of things we go by. So if a first-timer, of course, that's never been arrested before, it will have less bail and someone has been arrested 10, 20 times. And uh, status of whether you're homeless or not, and, and it's all because can we find you in case you don't show up to jail, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So bail is to ensure you show up to court. Okay, so let's say I set a bail, $100. That person cannot make bail. The very next day, that person's going to court. We're not holding them for three, four months like these legislators are talking about. They will go to court the very next day. Then it's in the judicial process of the judges. And nine times out of ten, the judge will let them go. So the bail reform is a bunch of crap. So, in essence, if you're arrested on a Friday night, the longest you may have to remain would be till Monday morning. Yes. Is that true? Yes, however... But, okay. We do have judges come to the main station on Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. Ah. One day, they'll come in person, and then they'll call later on. Well, we're, we will call them later in the afternoon. Okay. And give them another rundown, and they will release. And they, they will, will release the people. Man. And that's the end of any financial obligation. Yes. That's it. Except for felonies now, oh, no. which the bail will be higher because yes. it's a higher offense. Right. Right? Right. Again, set by a judge. Got it. Not by HPD. Brother Steve? And Rick, if I can just jump in here, I, I, we need to remind every, everybody in the listening audience that bail was created because our judicial system views people innocent until proven guilty. Bail was simply a way to make sure that those accused of a criminal offense stay involved in the criminal justice process bail is not bail was created to make sure that people weren't incarcerated while they were going through the process bail is designed to hold people accountable and give them a vested interest in making sure they participate in the process and let's just acknowledge this the united states of america has the best criminal justice system in the world is it a hundred percent fair all the time no but nothing's a hundred percent fair 
we have the best criminal justice system. As far as this concept about bail reform, I brought this up on previous shows with, with your listening audience. Mm-hmm. Elected officials are supposed to listen to their constituents. What I'd like to know from any elected officials, and I'm not you know, being antagonistic, the introducers of this bill, are you telling us the community within this state of the counties of Maui, Hawaii, Kauai, Honolulu, Maui, that your constituents were coming to your offices and blowing up your phone line saying, you know what, bail reform's important. That's what I wonder. I don't know about you, I don't want to live in New York. I don't want to, li- I'm, my hometown is Chicago, that's turning mm-hmm. into a train wreck over there, it's a dumpster mm-hmm. fire, mm-hmm. okay? No, everybody is leaving Chicago. They're leaving in droves. I want to live in Honolulu. I don't want our community to turn into one of these big cities that's having these exact challenges. As a matter of fact, you mentioned, Bobby, that we, we use New York City as an example because of a recent visit. You actually spoke with law enforcement officers about this very issue. Yes, they did this bail reform two years ago in 2019, uh, late 2019. They did it because they felt Rikers Island, which had a population of 7,000 inmates, uh, it was overcrowded, and they wanted to reduce the population. And they thought that by doing bail reform, they would be able to reduce the population and um, they would solve that problem. So they passed the bail reform, and they saw a 20% reduction in the population, down to a little over 5,000 5, inmates. But then what did they see? They saw crime skyrocket out of control, and that's what they're seeing today. So now what's needed is bail reform reform. Mm-hmm. Reform the reform. Reform the reform. Why even get to that point? Go ahead, Steve. No, Rick, I was okay. just going to add, too. When this legislation is introduced, when the legislators came together in their brain trust, what cities, what law enforcement leadership, what political leaders were, were being used as this is going to be successful? Where were they looking at? What mm-hmm. cities were they looking at where this worked? Who were they listening to? Who was in their ear? Who is sharing with them that this is the way our state wants to go? Is this really the will of the people that live here? There we go. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to take a very short, this is a very short break. Just want to get traffic in for folks out on the roads. When we return, we're going to continue on this tack, and I'm going to turn to Brother Mark to give us a perspective of what actually takes place with those who are apprehended and what their disposition is after that arrest and what this implication is of bail reform. We'll be back in a moment, 721. In the meantime, though, if you're just joining us, it is our discussion that's been ongoing and really germinated here on this program with this hour. Uh, When uh, the fellas brought this up when we were talking about the legislative session, kaboom, that's when the awareness kicked in and where we find ourselves now. Uh, 1567, Bobby, Steve, Mark in studio, your calls, 521-8383. Brother Mark, can you help us quantify what this all means to us? So let me uh, revert back to what Bobby was saying about New York and Rikers Island, right? So it it definitely applies to here. So, of course, when they let out all those people at Rikers, crime went up. I'm going to tell you what happened over here during COVID times, right? Right. They released the hounds, right? They, oh, we got to release prisoners from O-Trips in Halava because, you know, it's a, it's a covert thing. I don't know where the hell they came up with that. Mm-hmm. But they let out a ton of inmates. Then Chief Ballard assigned me to track uh, for the whole island of reoffenders. One-third reoffended. One-third. Three out of ten. Reoffended. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. When we make arrests now, when I was a desk lieutenant, And I'm being very conservative right now. At least 75% were not first-timers. They were repeat offenders. At least. And then daily, you have to see the amount of warrants that are issued. That these these officers are making a a warrant arrest because these guys haven't showed up to court. So now, if, if they were, say, incarcerated or somebody did their job on the other end, these officers have, wouldn't have to put themselves at risk to make a warrant arrest. And the burgeoning amount 
of warrants that are outstanding. It's crazy. Tens of thousands. You know, Mark brought up a great point, Rick, and that is um, when an individual doesn't show up to court, the court issues a warrant for their arrest. Mm -hmm. If we don't tie in, we don't have bail, and we let people reappear on their own recognizance, right? They, they're not tied into it. A warrant's going to get issued. The Honolulu Police Department is short-staffed. Has any thought gone into when a warrant is issued, how much manpower, how much money is going to go in to attempt to bring these individuals that didn't show up to court, arrest them, and make them appear in court? Have we even talked about this, that if we take away the monetary incentive on someone that's accused of a, of a crime, again, they're accused, right? They're not guilty, but they're accused to keep them involved in the judicial process. What it's going to take for those law enforcement officers at the sheriff department and all the police officers of the different counties, the manpower and the money it's going to take to bring these people in on the warrants that the courts are issuing. Issuing. Also want to make one point about the courts as well. Do we really want to tie the hands of our judges? If we go with this no bail for these various offenses, we basically take the judges and tie their hands when they're in the courtroom. The judges are there for a reason. If you get rid of bail reform, you take out the judge's ability to run the court as they see fit, and you tie the hands of the judges, and I think that's very dangerous. What you have is you have legislators overstepping their boundaries and getting into the legislators now, if you think about it, with this bail reform, are controlling the judiciary system. They're taking the control away from the judges, and legislators are now telling the judges what they can and can't do as far as bail, and I think that's extremely dangerous. We're going to go to some of our calls. So, fellas, headphones on at 727 in the morning. This is the Shopo Hour. I want to thank each and every one of you for being with us. Again, reminding you that this uh, conversation will be posted on our website as a podcast after today, after this morning. All right, in the order of receipt, it is Richard Honolulu. Gary Evil A will be next. Richard, aloha. You're on the show, Poe Hour. Good morning. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you for your service. Okay, I am not in favor of bail reform bill 1567, but let me play devil's advocate. One of the arguments on the other side is how much does plea bargaining play a part in this because innocent people are afraid of mandatory minimums for crimes they feel they did not commit because they are, they are afraid of our courts and don't want to go to trial. First of all, the premise of fearing our courts, I'm not sure that anybody in the criminal community fears our courts. I'm not dis discounting Richard's comment, but uh, thoughts about his uh, contribution. Once again, there are those, it all has to do, et cetera. Mark? So, well, um, plea bargains really have nothing to do with the police department mm -hmm. or, or police. That has to do with the prosecutor's office, right? They, they, they're the ones making the deals with the uh, defense attorney. So um, I really don't know where this would play a role in bail reform. It mean, have nothing, really doesn't have anything to do with it. Gotcha. Thank you, Richard, for your call. Gary, Eva Lay, 728 in the morning. You're on the show, po Hour, Gary. Hello. Hi, good morning. I, I really don't know much about this bail uh, system, but I did hear that, you know, you hear a person has like $250,000 bail, and then uh, somebody said, yeah, it sounds astronomical, like almost like the price of a house, but they only got to come up with 10% of it, and they're out in the road. Now, how, how does that work? Bail bonding. Go ahead. Poppy, please. I'll give you a prime example. <clears throat> a couple of years ago in the Big Island, a man by the name of Justin Waikie. He was a convicted felon on a drug and firearm offense in 2013. He was released on probation. He violated that probation. He was then picked up. The judge... Uh, or the prosecutors asked for that violation of probation to make his bail $20,000. The judge thought it was too high. So the judge dropped it to 7000 He put up the 10%. He got out. And four months later, our officer, Bronson Kaliloa, stopped him, and Justin ended up killing Bronson. 
That's a perfect example. Well, certainly is. Thank you, Bobby, uh, for sharing that. And once again, uh, putting in perspective exactly what the conversation is focusing on today. Gary, uh, Eva Lay, thank you so very much. Ben, Pearl City, Brian, IA, you will be next after we turn from the bottom of the hour break. I'd like to have, uh, once again, uh, Brother Steve, can you tell us how we can learn more about Shopo and how we can learn more about our officers who wear the badge? Absolutely, Rick. Happy to do that. I'd like to share with the listening audience, you guys can reach us at Honolulu. Sorry. I was going to say, if you want to know about the department, it's HonoluluPD.org. As far as Shopo, it's ShopoHawaii.org. The page is under construction, but if you go there again, ShopoHawaii.org, you're going to have access to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and it will route you right there. Shopo Hour continues, and we'll share about how you can learn even more online this evening. How you can do that, we'll share with you in a moment. It is 731. Welcome back. We are going to the phone lines at 521-8383. We actually have many topics on which to cover, but clearly the the, uh, topic of discussion, 1567, passed by the legislature last week, is very top of mind. It is Ben out in Pearl City leading us off. Brian will be next. Ben, aloha to you. You're on the show po Hour. Good morning. Good morning, Rick. Thank you for what you do. It's about time somebody do this. Good morning. And my brothers, good morning, good morning. Morning, Ben. Good morning, hey, Ben. Um, about, this good morning. Bill, about this bill reform thing, during my time uh, in the department, I used to hate going to uh, neighborhood board meetings only because the politicians that would show up, they would talk both sides out their mouth. And whenever there was a complaint that was um, within a community, like Chinatown, for example, Chinatown was getting hit big, big, big time crime, all the homeless and stuff. And a president of the Chinatown neighbor, um, Chinatown Business Association, would ask, "What is the police doing about this? What can the police do?" And Carl Rhodes would always be there, always, you know, uh, supporting the business association and cracking on the police department and saying that we're not doing enough. Now, it surprises me, well, not really, that he's one of the big supporters of this bill reform. What I used to do all the way till I retired is whenever I go to a case or I had officers ask me, what are we going to do? I tell them, hey. They're trying to blame the police for this. Tell them to go to the neighborhood board meeting. And then when the, um, they have questions, ask the politicians, ask the people, the lawmakers that's uh, at the pol- uh, neighborhood board, uh, board meeting, why? Why this is going on? And I think the neighborhood board meetings, there's a lot of people out there now that are against this bill reform. I think it make more impact if not these people are held, um, held accountable directly face-to-face at these neighborhood board meetings. I think it would make a lot, especially if you know, the officers now would kind of carry on what I would do. People would ask why. i say go to the neighborhood board meeting and ask them why. We're doing all we can. Brother Ben, thank you so, so very much for your thoughts and your commentary and your perspective. By the way, the most powerful word in the English language I've taught my children is the word why. Commentary on Ben's call. Yeah, you know, Ben. Well, you're you're right on. Um, you got to go to these neighborhood boards. You got to hold these politicians accountable. I, I have to give credit to when, when I was in Waikiki. I held meetings with our um, particular representatives. One was Sharon Moriwaki, and the other was Adrian Tam. And I give them credit. They voted against this dumb bail reform bill, and because they sat down with me, they sat down with the neighborhood board. They sat sat down with a lot of us and asked us what was going on. So. I give them a lot of credit. As far as Carl Rhodes, it doesn't surprise me that he he supported this. You know, he's probably one of the single most threats to uh, Honolulu society right now. And I've seen some of the bills he tried to push through, he introduced. I've been following these bills for years. This guy is radical. We need to get him out of there. He's ridiculous. You're dialed in together. It is the show po hour, and back to your calls at 7:40. Make it 7:39 in the morning. 
As promised, Brian, I thank you for your patience, Brian, and you are on the air. Good morning. Hey, good morning to you, Rick, and everyone else up there. I um, I used to work directly for Mark Criccio when I was in receiving. And um, good morning, LT. I knew him as LT back then. I'm sure he, he promoted with as, as a major. But what he's saying is true. Is is you know it's just redundant. It's a hypocrisy. The when when we went to the academy, it was kind of a joke, and we didn't want to believe it as young recruits. And that's and that's the worst thing about it is in the academy, they're joking about these guys will be back on the street. Their bail will be either you know paid or not even posted before you're done writing your report. You'll be leaving the squad room, and these guys are already back on the streets. And the uh, the officers have to keep going back and back, back and you know just keep going back to these same old calls. And and then as you get more into the patrol life, you understand that you know these prosecutors that we have, they only want to take cases that are are served to them on silver platters. You know it, everything has to be perfect for them to even attempt to even take the case, or it just gets dumped, and you're back to the square one again. So. You know, there, I know there's there's a movie not too long ago called Law Abiding Citizen, and you know I don't know if anybody's taking into account the the effects of letting people out and who have hurt these families, who have hurt others, and whatever else the case might be. At at some point, our citizens are not going to have trust in this judicial system anymore, and there's going to be a lot of vigilante justice. There's going to be a lot of people taking things into their own hands. And what are we going to do then? That's all I have to say, but thank you. Brother, thank you so very much. That's Brian in IAEA. And again, valuable perspective indeed. Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, Yeah. Brian, uh, good to hear your voice. Uh, We hated to see you go, but uh, Brian's on to bigger and better things. Uh, He uh, resigned from the department. He has his own Mm -hmm. business now, but um, uh, it was a pleasure to have him work under me. But, uh, yeah, but again, he saw it firsthand. Right. Uh, it's just a revolving door, and we didn't even have bail reform, or they call it reform. It's not reform. It's just their own little agenda. Let's let's put it where it is. Well, let's get that definition, and I'm going to ask Bobby, why, why all, why is this all going on? What's what's at the heart of it? Well, the real backstory is that they wanted to pass this bail reform so that they don't have to build a new prison. Mm-hmm. That's really what happened here. Yep. Um, you know, and people they get uh, on the other side, maybe they get a little bit excited when we have lawmakers talking about building a new prison, but it needs to be done. And when you say build a new prison, it doesn't mean, okay, now we have all this bed, st- bed space, we're going to fill it up with, with you know a whole bunch of people from our community. No. We have OCCC, which is run down, it's beyond repair, and a new prison, whether it's you know to be done this year, next year, or five years from now, it has to be done. Um, and... I think what the law, the lawmakers should do instead of focusing on changing the way bail is, you build a new prison up in Halava, which the governor already had um, designated a location at the quarantine. That's right. And then you move everything there to be the new OCCC, and then you take the OCCC and you turn that into a rehab center for these, you know, individuals, whether it's educational services medical services, uh, if you have those that are mentally ill and can be rehabilitated without going to the state hospital, do it there. Um, if they don't have their GED, bring in uh, th- the thousands of retired teachers that we have. Put them on 89-day contracts and give these people their GED. Give them some college-level courses. Uh, give them a trade that they can learn. You know, That way, when they do come out, they can reintegrate into the community and then become model, model citizens. I don't think we take the position that we want to lock these people up and throw away the key. No. We have to rehabilitate them because they're, they're our, our family, our friends, and, and they're a part of the community. And I think that's the approach that we need to take. I've reported earlier, and just to reaffirm, that once again, House Finance Chair Sylvia Luke, it was conditional. This bill passed. We had a multi-billion dollar budget surplus. We had expenditures to Native Hawaiian uh, allocations alone of a billion dollars. Not taking away from that, but we had a remaining zero 
zero dollars allocated to prison construction. Steve? Bobby, Bobby makes a great point, Rick, and that is uh, building a prison doesn't mean that we throw away any social programs or programs that can help offenders get back on their feet, give them the training they need. But we need to give those that are running our correction system in this state the tools they need to be successful. And if that means that one of the tools to be successful in corrections is to have a facility that is large enough to safely house offenders. Here's what's interesting. Everybody's harping on bail reform. For those of you that are against prisons, you, you want to talk about offenders' rights? Well, do we want them overcrowded? Do we want them to live? You, do, uh, o, o, o trips is like super overcrowded. If we build a prison, they're at least treated humanely, right? They're, they're given conditions where it's not going to turn into a powder keg. The other thing here is, Bobby's point, oh, you build a prison, people just want to lock people up, throw away the keys. When we build a hospital, a nice big hospital, does anybody say, oh, we're just promoting people to get sick? When we build a hospital, does anybody say, oh, you know what, they're just promoting sick care or they just want to fill the hospital up? They want to be prepared. We simply want our state on the correction side. Now, keep in mind, gang, prison. If you're going to prison, that means you've gone through our amazing criminal justice system, which is the best in the world, and you've been found guilty of doing an offense that carries at least probably a five-year stint. So there's a, let's clarify now, there's a difference between jail and prison. Mm -hmm. If we're building a prison, that means somebody was convicted of a crime where they have to go away for five years. If the corrections professionals in our state are saying that we need a prison, why would we fight them on this? Give them what they need to be successful. And then we look into, to Bobby's point, with the existing structure O-TRIPS that that's, could be used for off-site education, inmate training, inmate development. Let's use it for that. But we need to give our corrections leaders the ability to do their job effectively. Because if you're telling me that the way to fix this is to just not keep people incarcerated and put them back in our community, at what expense? At what expense? Mm -hmm. At the victim's expense. Exactly. And this is the first time that even in this discussion where we invoke victims we invoke the law-abiding citizen by the way great movie and it, and we need to have a refocus from elected officials to be proponents and advocates for law-abiding citizens who are subjected to the repetitive nature final point uh, with Steve I'm not even sure we have emerged from a federal consent decree for our prisons because of overcrowding and decrepit conditions and failure to rehabilitate, things of that nature. There's been no investment on all counts, and this bill was the facilitator of shutting down completely. And we, you have those that are very vocal talking about inmates' rights and inmates' reform. Here's my question. Everybody that is released because of overcrowding or everybody that's released with no bail, do you want them to live right next to you, let's plant them right next to your house. Let's have yeah. that halfway house, that transition home, right next to where you live and see if that's okay with you. I am way up against a break. However, Kanani's call is going to be very important. I'm just going to run our primetime traffic because I want folks to have a idea of what they're dealing with out on the roadways. All right, welcome back. Use the time remaining as well as possible with brothers Bobby Steve and Mark, I'm Rick, and it is Kanani who joins us on the program. Thank you for your patience so much, and welcome to the show. Good morning. Good morning. I'll just take a few moments of your time. I've been a victim of break-ins at my home several times, but I did not witness them. However, these last two break-ins in my home, I was present Say, for example, using the bathroom, and a couple of months later, which was just a few weeks ago, I was sleeping in the middle of the night. At about midnight or late, during that time, someone broke into my home. I wasn't harmed because I did not uh, see them. Had I seen them, it would have, they would have attacked me in some way or another. And I know for a fact that there's 
former prisoners who are in, in, in the illegal camps here in Waianae. And one is located and growing uh, not even a quarter of a mile away from my home. So if former prisoners, of, for a fact I know, are living there, what about those who are off scot free on this ridiculous uh, law that has been passed? I'm against it, not 100% against it. I'm 1,000% against it. And I believe that's all I have to say. And although I've, I've had to deep, dig, I'm sorry, dig deep into my savings to get security at my home, mentally, I'm still not, you might say, back to normal mentally. That's all I have to say. And if these things happen to these legislatures who have voted for it, what it happens to their family? They'll know about it. I'm over 85 years old. Thank you very much, officers, for doing your job and more. And to you, Rick, you're just a wonderful asset to the whole state and to the U.S. And Dikonani, thank you so, so very much for sharing, because those are the underreported voices that are rarely acknowledged in the whole debate and discussion in the big square building. Do you hear it in her voice? Amen. Brother, heart's breaking, chicken skinny. Yeah. 85-year-old auntie who's in her home, subjected to numerous violations of her safety and her property. It's hurtful. And they consider that a non-violent crime. Non-violent crime. That guy would walk if they caught him. Thank you, Carl Rhodes. Auntie, uh, thank you so, so very much, and please uh, remain with us. We appreciate you so much. Brett, uh, Eva Beach, I think Brett's going to be our final call because we need some time together to wrap things up, but we want to make sure that Brett has an opportunity, and we thank you, Brett, for being on the show, Po Hour. Good morning. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, guys. Uh and make sure you go back and thank all your uh, fellow officers, men and women, for all what they are doing to fight to keep us protected here in Hawaii. Uh, for full disclosure, Rick, as you may, as you probably know, I'm uh, the chairman of the Honolulu County Republican Party. Uh, I just wanted to say that last caller is exactly what uh, I was going to call about. Uh, you can go back and you can see the videos on HB 1567 in the testimony. All the testifiers are were in support of this, with the exception of Honolulu County Prosecutor's Office that testified against it. So one thing that was glaring to me is there was no testifiers that were victims or uh, testifying uh, in advocating for victims of these so-called nonviolent uh you know, uh, crimes that they're, that they're calling. And Rick, you, you talked about it a lot, uh, leading up to this about, you know, somebody's car getting broken into or your home getting broken into when you're not at home. But, you know, that was the thing that really stuck out to me was that they didn't, no, there was no victim advocate there. So my question to the, to the guys are, what does this do? To victims, you guys are involved with, and your officers are involved with victims. And you know, I'm sure when you when a victim finds out that their offender was was released, or the person that caused their committed the crime against them gets is released on bail, or even just released or let go. Uh, you know, what is? Have you guys gotten any feedback from? From victims of crimes, nonviolent crimes, or anything okay. uh, that that would help, uh, you know maybe push this, and then I would just say, you know, contact everybody listening in this. Contact the governor's office. Tell them to veto the bill. Mahalo, Rick. Thank you, Brett, for the call. Uh, Brett, thank you indeed. I'm going to turn it over to the boys. We have just about four minutes remaining in the program. Who'd like to lead off? <clears throat> I can I can tell you this. Thank you so much for your call. Appreciate you, sir. When officers statewide respond to a criminal offense that has just occurred and they affect an arrest, 
you can look at the complainant slash victim's face and you can actually see briefly that there's a relief that they know that the offender that either did this to their property or their person is going to be held accountable. Granted, it's the first step in the judicial process. You can see the relief on their face when they're taken into custody. For that moment, at least at that moment, they feel that their person and property are safe. Additionally, when I've responded to scenes with, with officers I work with in a supervisory position, I've never had a victim or a complainant say to me, Hey, Sarge, you know what? I know this guy did wrong, but you know what? I don't want him, I don't want him to stay in jail. You know, he's down on his luck. Do you really have to arrest him? Does he really need to spend any time in jail? I've never once as a police officer worked in the streets here in Honolulu, and I'm sure that my brothers and sisters on the other counties would tell you, we've never had a victim of crime say to us, you know what, I don't want this person to, to go to jail. I don't want him take I don't want him or her to take a ride into the cell block. Never. 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 Bobby? Oh, and that's when uh Brett brought up about being victim of a crime. I don't think that's what the legislators are thinking. You know, are are people that live in this community in Hawaii, which is a high cost of living, they have two, three jobs. In order to make ends meet and in order to have things for them and their family that, you know, they they pay money every month, right? A car, whether it's uh, the home that they live in or whatnot, and to and to be a victim of a crime, property crime, to be violated, you don't know that feeling until you're in that mm-hmm. position, until mm-hmm. your personal space is invaded, mm-hmm. uh, which is, um, I forgot, her, uh, Kanani, what Kanani called. Yeah. You can hear it in her voice, you know. She, you, you still heard that trauma, even though it was, let's say, a, a nonviolent crime, a property crime. There is still trauma associated with that. Bobby's a thousand percent correct. Unless you've gone through it and you've walked in the shoes, you have no business trying to make opinions on it. When you've been a victim of crime, I, you'll look at this in an entirely different perspective. And today, later on today, folks, you'll have an opportunity to learn even more. Bobby, walk us through what's happening online with SSH today. Today with uh, Stolen Stuff Hawaii and Michael Kitchens, myself and Steve will be on with him at 5.30 this afternoon on Facebook Live, and we'll have a good discussion on this and try to educate uh, the community on where this bill is leading us. Amen. Be sure. I'll I'll be joining today online. All of our friends dialed in now, please do the same. Mark, final thought. We have uh, less than uh, less than a minute. Well, just to uh, reiterate what Bobby and Steve was saying about the victims, and then uh, you could hear it in uh, Kanani's voice. When we respond to all these cases, you you, you see the the traumatic expressions on these victims' faces, even if it's just a property crime. But you know, of, co- of course, we respond to a lot of violent crimes also, but. For your house being broken into, are you going to sleep properly? Think about it, right? Yeah. Um, it's just they don't think about the victims. And, and, and Rick, I, I want to thank you for having this show because that's why we're here. You know, we have to, someone to have, has to have the victim's voice. It's ridiculous. No one, no one has their back. And I would thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that. And I would encourage, if you have been subjected to a crime, utilize this program as your first step of advocacy you have support your sharing it is empowering to the rest of our community to try not just to be empathetic but to at least gain some knowledge and perspective of that reality bobby steve mark the show po hour brothers i can't wait till we do it again Thank you so much. See you next week. See you next week, Rick.